When I say Hall of Fame, I think of Jeff Perlman. I think of my great friend Jeff Perlman, <laughs> who wrote the book that just came out as a actually about to come out, the HBO show Showtime. Now it's called Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty trailer. And Jeff, I'm so glad that you came up. You were so cool, too, about jockeying, because when I texted you yesterday and said, can you switch the 10 and the 11? It's for Jerry West. I mean, what are you going to do? Say no, it's Jerry <laughs> West, right? When you're a sports writer, like Marshall Falk gets asked these things all the time, come on TV, when you're a sports writer, nobody ever calls you. You just sit in your little hovel in your dark cave. So That's you true. call. Also, Susie calls you. You, you. you show up. I would hope so. You do? Because I know where you Rich live. Rich Eisen calls you, think about it. Susie calls, <laughs> you're here. Dude, I, I book, TJ, do I book it better guests or what? Come on. Uh, look, I'm not trying to get involved. Your guests are great, but I don't want to like, you know, I got to stay TJ, here when you, you go gotta, back. You got to take a stand. <laughs> You know, Susie, your guests are better. If, if you don't stand for something, what your do you fall for, Mike? You got Perlman on the show. Yeah. Yes, you do it, Susie. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. I love the fact that this is coming out, that you have Adam McKay to option and take your book all the way. What was that like for you to get the call saying your Lakers Showtime is now going to become an HBO show? I just didn't believe it. I, I truly didn't believe it. And this uh, book came out in 2014. It sold really well, but you just write a book to write a book. And there's this guy, he was a screenwriter named Jim Hecht. And his credits were Ice Age. Like, that, that was his credits. And he calls me, he's like, I love this book. I love this book. I swear to God, this is a true story. And I don't believe him. I believe he likes the book, but I don't. He's like, I want to make this. We can make this into something. I'm like, okay, whatever. And uh, he's like, well, well, let's meet. I'll come to your house. I'll come to your house. And I lived in New Rochelle, New York at the time. He comes on Easter 2014. Two Jews on Easter. We're having family dinner. He shows up. And he shows up, I swear to God, with three things because there's not that much open on Grand Central Station and, and Easter. He shows up in my house with a block of Baker's chocolate, a tomato, like a big tomato, and a bottle of wine drink. Not wine, wine drink. Wine drink. Because I guess they were the only things you could find. And he shows up in my house on Easter and my family's like, who the hell is this guy? And my wife calls me in the kitchen and she's like, who, the hell, who is this guy? I'm like, I don't know, he wants to... And he talks and he talks about it. And I don't believe anything he says. And over the years, he's like, no, it's going to happen. It's going to happen. And one day he says, uh, Adam McKay wants, wants to meet with us. And I didn't know who Adam McKay was. <laughs> Am I supposed, I'm actually being serious. Adam think, McKay, for any of you who's listening, he, was, uh, he and Will Ferrell were longtime partners. He's one of the most prolific producers, yeah. directors, writers in Hollywood. So I should have known who he was. Yeah. Good job. <laughs> if you like you. So I literally go to his house. And I'm Googling Adam McKay outside his house. Like, I had no idea who Adam McKay was. Could you tell by the fact that he had a great house that he, did he have may a great have done house. a lot of things? I know, yeah, I know. Just saying. So uh, I go in and he's like, I love the book and blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, oh, this is great. You don't hear anything. And one day you get this contract from HBO. And the next thing you know, you start seeing John C. Riley and Sally Field. And it's, it's the craziest thing that's ever happened to me. Jeff Perlman here on The Rich Eisen Show. It's called Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty. That's what it's called on HBO. The book was, of course, called Showtime because of the Showtime Lakers. What made Showtime so special, so sexy, and so captivating? I mean, I think Jerry Buss. It's so common now with, with the NBA and, and the uh, every team has loud music and every team has dancing cheerleaders and every team has, you know, entertainment out the out the butt, but uh, I can't believe I just said that. But back then, <laughs> um, it wasn't a thing. You know, you'd have a boring halftime show. Uh, it would be very, you know, boring and stale. And Jerry Buss comes along and he's like, this has to be showtime. This has to be entertainment. People aren't just coming to watch basketball. They're coming to be entertained. And we're going to start getting celebrities and we're going to give them seats by the court and people are going to show up and they're going to want to see them. And then obviously the, the, the biggest of the big is they, they luck into the number one pick in the 79 draft and they get Magic Johnson. And, um, you know, you just had Jerry West on and Jerry West is one of the geniuses in basketball and he may not admit this to you, but he wanted Sidney Moncrief. Like, he wanted Sidney Moncrief number one. And there was this fight with the Lakers, Magic Johnson, Sidney Moncrief, because the argument was we already have Norm Nixon, who's a great point guard. Magic Johnson's going to be the six nine point guard. How's that going to work against small, you know, the tiny Archibalds of the NBA? How's it going to work? And uh, Jerry Buss was steadfast. We need to take this guy. This guy has something special about him. And that was sort of the birth of it. And in going and trying to recapture lightning in the bottle, and you're watching your book turn into a movie, mm -hmm. what was 
What did they get right, do you think, that as we watch, we're going to say, I really believe John C. Riley as Dr. Boss? All right, so the casting of Magic is the most interesting one to me, actually. So John C. Riley is a great actor, obviously. Adrian Brody plays Pat Riley. He's fantastic. Sally Field, amazing, right? There's this guy named Quincy Isaiah who plays Magic Johnson. And I love everything about his story. First of all, like Magic, he's from Michigan. He was a college football player at a small school in Michigan. Nobody had ever heard of him. And you watch him and he just oozes Magic Johnson. I've never, it's uncanny. It's almost like uh, my wife and I will watch him and you'll be like, wait, is that Magic? Oh no, that's Quincy playing Magic. And they just, they nail it. They just nail it. It's one of the best pieces of casting I've ever seen on any TV show ever. And it just happens to be based on my book, which is insane. Which, which you have to think is still like absolutely crazy. It's ridiculous. I mean, there was this day, there was this day a couple of years ago, they were filming the pilot and they said, do you and your wife want to make cameos in the pilot? And I'm like, well, why wouldn't I, right? <laughs> we spent, I show up and they have a trailer with my name on it. And yes, they misspelled my last name, but it was still my name You've on the trailer. You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> they, they left out the A in Perlman. So it was P-E-R-L-M-A-N. But I still had a trailer, damn it. And uh, I show up, my wife shows up and they put us in makeup and I'm playing a reporter. And my wife actually gets a speaking line. She, she plays the... Uh, the secretary to Rod Thor and the Bulls GM, and it's all during the, the draft sequence. And craft services, all the food is free. I'm like taking out a wallet. No, 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 it's free. You can eat it all. And it was just, it was this magical, magical day. And the craziest thing, there's a book called The Hate You Give by Angie Thomas, which is a great book. And I had this conversation with her where she said, there's something so trippy about you write this thing and then you're you're in it. Like you're actually it's a three-dimensional thing come to life. And that's really what it was like for me. It was just one of the weirdest and coolest experiences in my life. I think there's not a single person in life who wants to be shown on camera by an actor less than Jerry West. Yes. I mean, can you imagine? He will be so mortified because he's so, Jerry doesn't like any attention. He, he's so humble. He will be horrified that He's being played by a, a Hollywood actor. All right, so Jason Clark plays him, and uh, it's ridiculous how good he is. I'm not just saying I wouldn't like. I just wouldn't bring it up. It's oh, well, you're not going to say he's stunk. No, but book. I wouldn't say anything if he was like if he was if I didn't think I wouldn't say anything. And um, the thing about Jerry West that I love, there are two guys I've covered who do this: Billy Bean and Jerry West, where they can't watch their own team play, and their team is either whether they're doing well or poorly. They're circling around the arena or Billy Bean used to drive his car when the A's were playing. And Jason Clark captures that, like this sort of thing of Jerry West, like perfectly. And I just think it's amazing. The guys like that who really can't take enjoyment in the highs of it all, like the lows beat them far more than the highs uh, give them pleasure. It's a really weird, it's a weird phenomenon. It's captured really well, I think. And you've wrote, You've written the all-time telling book about the Lakers three-peat that you and I lived through together as I covered the Lakers from 2000 to 2003 during that period. And by the way, if I don't have some kind of role written into this, you and I are going to throw down. I'm just That's saying, fair. like, I was there every night, remember? You know, I, I was I was going to wear my sunglasses because I've gone very Hollywood. Yeah. I'll talk to my, have your people call my people. Right, and, and, and we'll by that, I'll call them? Is yeah. that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, What... As, as you look at that era, as we look at the Shaq and Kobe era, because Shaq's coming on tomorrow, mm -hmm. what stands out to you about a moment in that time where you realized that you were watching, you were, you were chronicling, you were a part of something incredibly special and great unfolding before your eyes? Oh, man. I mean, to me, it's when Kobe shows up at his first training camp, and it's 97, and they're all standing in a circle, 97, did I get that right? 96, excuse 96. me. 96. And they're all standing in a circle, and this is his first camp, and they're all introducing themselves. It's like, hey, I'm Shaq, you know you know who I am. Hey, I'm Eddie Jones, I played at Temple, I'm Nick Vanek, and he's named, my name's Kobe, nobody here is gonna punk me. Mm. Like, that was his introduction. He's 18, barely 18 years old, nobody here is gonna punk me. And it set this tone, and I wouldn't say it was a very wise approach, you know, like the other players like who the hell is this guy but it really set the tone for who that guy was and the attitude he brought to basketball he brought it because he had that chip on his shoulder about being a kid of, of affluence right and coming in and speaking languages and speaking fluent italian being the son of jelly bean i think he was trying to right 
lay the gauntlet down already that you can't screw with me. And, and, and in fact, you wonder if part of that was, and we'll, n- we'll never really know the answer now, but part of it was just trying to protect himself, right? And trying to guard himself because Shaq was such a different kind of guy. And- I think um, a lot of his career was trying to put forth an image. And I really think it seems like he found himself after he retired. And later in his career when he wasn't quite the player and he sort of became this almost fatherly type figure because I feel like a lot of his career, I think you saw this, was putting up a front. Mm -hmm. I'm tough Kobe. You can't mess with me Kobe. And the guy was an intellectual, very intelligent, um, sensitive human being who always felt he had to put up a front. And I always think like, that has to be so exhausting to live that life. Like Shaq was the opposite. There was no front. What you saw with Shaq was basically what you got with Shaq. And Kobe had this shell, this plexiglass shield he put up around himself. The older his girls got, the more he became relaxed. Definitely. And he seemed to almost fit into his own skin better as the girls got older. Yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the horrible, I mean, there are a million of them, horrible tragedies about his passing is he really was this guy who was blossoming and coming into his own. And you saw him, I mean, what I always think of, and I bet you do too, is him sitting with Gigi at that game, Mm -hmm. breaking down the play and just this beautiful moment. I just, I mean, it's the saddest thing ever, obviously. Jeff Perlman here on the Rich Eisen Show. Susie Schuster in for Rich Eisen. Jeff, um, Charles Barkley in the first hour said, I think he put it this way, the Lakers stink. What are your thoughts on the Lakers as they are right now? Yeah, they stink. It's mm-hmm. the worst constructed team. I have a, <laughs> I have a kid who lives down the street from me named Drew. who every He lives and dies with the Lakers. And he's like, no, nah, I think they're really getting it together. He's always like, they're getting it together. <laughs> and I'm like, Drew, this team sucks. This is terrible. This is the worst constructed team ever. The Westbrook thing is a, it's just a fiasco that we all saw coming from the beginning. And then the worst thing is you look around the league and you see Brandon Ingram playing well with New Orleans. New, New Orleans. You saw what Caruso was doing before he got hurt. You saw what Ball was doing. And they had these nice pieces. And now they're just a really old. It's impossible for them to come out of the West. Like actually impossible for them to come out of the West. Disagree? Can't say I disagree, and especially with AD getting hurt with that ankle sprain, because all, we all know that sometimes a fracture is a better injury than an ankle sprain, because that ankle sprain, once you do it, comes back again and again. Street clothes, right? That's what Barkley's calling him right now, street clothes. I think it's a bad sign when the people I know who are huge Laker fans are super excited about Austin Reeves. Like, <laughs> everyone I know is like, this is Austin Reeves. Oh, it's like... When you're getting excited about the ninth man in your rotation or a guy who should be the ninth man in your rotation, you have some issues. Well, that three-pointer was really pretty last night. Brockman, what do you got? Yeah, Jeff, uh, quickly switching to baseball. Uh, You wrote an amazing book about Barry Bonds a while back. What did you make of him not making the Hall of Fame this year and all the discussion that surrounded that this past year with David Ortiz getting elected? I love that question. Um, because I was 100% against Bonds getting in. I've been outspoken about Bonds. He shouldn't get in. He cheated, he cheated, he cheated. And I feel like this year, the writers basically blew up my own argument. Like once you let Ortiz in, who we know cheated as well, like we know David Ortiz cheated. We know he used PEDs, PD. The moment you say, well, we're gonna let him in because he's always been nice to us and he has a nice smile and he's good with the kids, that ends any argument against Bonds. Like that's it. Because that's not what it's about. So to me, at this point, I really, I've really i never said this before, but Bonds belongs in, McGuire belongs in, Sosa belongs in, Clemens belongs in. All wow. these guys, like you just decided, you, you guys made this decision. We're going to let in this guy because we love him and because he was nice to us. Well, fine. But then you got to let them all in. Are you a voter? I'm not a voter. I'm just a loud person. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think he eventually gets in on some sort of veterans committee or they have the... the- a new recent one about, uh, I forget the name of it, but do you think they eventually get in? I do, because I, I think, I would say nine out of 10 players I've spoken with over the years support him getting in. They know none of them like him. Right. He's one of the least likable human beings you'll ever find in your life. At least he was as a player. But there's no denying that he's maybe the greatest we've ever seen. Of course. And if we're, again, if we're gonna, if we're just not gonna care about cheating, if that's just not a factor, he has to be in. And this kind of goes back to what Jerry said too. Jerry West, of course, our guest in the last hour. Is, or is that it's how you treat people. Now, I happen to enjoy interviewing Barry Bonds. I was very lucky to have a good relationship with him, so I covered him um, for the last couple of years of his career and throughout the World Series. But the, most people didn't have that relationship with him, and I feel like, speaking on his behalf, I feel like he had a lot in his past that he hadn't unpacked, 
and that he took that out in the field with him. And that's my own personal perspective, but that's mine. The fact of the matter is, is where do you draw the line? I mean, you either play the game with integrity and you, or you don't. I mean, if Ortiz gets in, right, and he has, but he's been a great guy. But Clemens doesn't get in or Barry doesn't get in. It's not a popularity contest. It's a numbers game. I agree. It's the same with Schilling. Like Schilling hasn't gotten in. I agree with nothing Kurt Schilling says ever. There's there's no human being on this planet I disagree with more than Kurt Schilling, but he belongs in the Hall of Fame. Like that's irrelevant. What I think about his political opinions is completely irrelevant. He belongs in the Hall of Fame. And again, if we're going to let cheaters in, we're just acknowledging this guy cheated, but he's a nice guy. Then we have to let in the ones who weren't nice guys too. Have to. What are you working on now? What's the next book? I have a Bo Jackson biography coming out in uh, October. Hmm. We know a lot about that life between baseball and football through Dion. How's Bo's house and closet? <laughs> that I don't know. Yeah, you got to find out. You got to find out it? where the money goes. Yeah, huh? he's a hunter. He's a hunter. He's a hunter. With bow no, and arrow. All right, when we come back. With bow and arrow. Right? Oh God, yeah. I don't want to talk Wait, he about used to, that. When animals. he was with the Royals, he used to take his bow and shoot it in the clubhouse. What? And the <laughs> players would complain to the GM and be like, you know, Bo, and no one had the guts to say anything to Bo. Like, no one's gonna be like, listen, Bo, you really need to think about this. Yeah, it's amazing. Jeff, wasn't there a, a story about Bo as a kid that he would kill pigs by throwing rocks at them? Oh, uh, you're this stealing my best material, oh. that is true. <laughs> the, well, there was a, um, I mean, it's, you can, his nickname, so Bo derives from Bohog, which is Borhog. He lived in the deep south in Bessemer, Alabama. And, uh, I've been to this farm. There was a, up the street from where he lives, there was this guy who raised pigs, boars. And Bo and his friends one day show up and they, they're, they're with rocks and sticks and they're just beating the crap out of this enormous boar hog. And um, they get caught and they threaten to send Bo to uh, a way to, you know, private military school. And, uh, it's sort of the moment where he first realizes maybe I shouldn't be such a horrible kid. He was a horrible, horrible kid as far as behavior, which he's acknowledged, but really interesting guy. Oh God, I love you, but and now I now I hate Bo Jackson. No, no, okay? no, he's oh. great. He's a great guy. He's great. He's great. <laughs> sure. Yeah. You know how I feel about animals. He's that, no that's, Marshall that's Falk. A, that, he's, no, he's no Marshall Falk. No. That, that's a tough sell. <laughs> yeah. Don't beat up a boar hog. Come he was on. a kid. He was a kid. Oh, good Lord. All right, Jeff, Perl- what's your Twitter handle? Because you are a funny. At Jeff Perlman. Yeah, that's great. With an A. With an A. Yeah. <laughs> when does uh, Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty come out? March 6th on HBO. March 6th. All right. Watch it on HBO, please. And then stay tuned, of course, for my huge part in the Lakers 3 Pete. You got it. Television program, I got you in right? There. Yeah. Yeah, just keep me posted. Let me know when my call time is and spell my name right, will you please? I'll do my best. I'll get you a trailer. Hey, you watched all the way to the end. Thanks for that. Watch more right here.